around. But in, a, in essence, what we're going to use our time to talk about today is what, what I'll dare say is the holy grail of all metrics, donor retention. And most importantly, how can you collect reliable and actionable data from your constituents in a very rigorous and analytical way that you can then build yourselves a blueprint on how to build loyalty between your constituents. And as we build loyalty, as I'll show you today, we are going to build retention and we are also going to build the most important thing, which is value. So the session title, uh, let me simplify this. The, the, the cut through all the jargon, if you will, and say that simply stated, the goal of our business, Donor Voice, and, and, and frankly, the goal of this presentation is to talk about how we can answer two critical questions, right? The, the kind of why people give and equally important kind of why do people stop giving? If we can understand those two things, we can kind of crack the code on what it takes to retain constituents to the program, to the event, and to the organization. So here's kind of the, the breakdown of what we're going to cover. I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of donor centric, right? So I've kind of I've I have as many buzzwords as I could fit into my session title, but let's introduce another one. At conferences, industry wide, we always talk about donor centric, and I want to kind of make a, a few kind of points or kind of offer some food for thought to think about in regards to that. The second piece is in kind of this this middle section, we're going to talk about how do we build a blueprint. And this is this is really the, the kind of the key to, and the kind of the core deliverable in our work. This is a blueprint, and we refer to this blueprint much in the exact same way that you know it, the blueprint for building a house or a building, right? This is kind of the framework in terms of all the design, all the pieces, and how they come together and they build a house, okay? So how do we actually build a blueprint from all of the kind of the touch points and experiences that we create? What of those things actually matter to driving loyalty? And then if we increase loyalty, we can increase retention and giving. So we're going to kind of talk and walk through uh, kind of a case study of a large national organization and how they used this process and this, 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 this data to essentially inform kind of the overarching kind of walk program, which was kind of their, their kind of one of their signature events. And at the end of this, I'm going to kind of bring this all together and we're going to look at how this kind of informs the new donor journey based on that's it's not kind of the one that we built, but it's validated based on the input from our constituents and how it can change. And then how we put all this together and we can kind of essentially create a strategic plan or an action plan around what are the areas that we should focus on to, uh, to improve this donor experience and improve retention. So let's just get right into it. The, the, this first piece, kind of talking about donor centricity. And, and the, as the slide says here, this is, to be candid, this is our point of view of the world, right? If you aren't actively engaging your constituents about their experience, the ones that you've created, then you're not, you're not donor centric. You're, you can be well intentioned, but you're not donor centric. We have to be, we're creating uh, in the kind of the uh, donor mapping, the voice of the customer world and the commercial side, they talk about kind of what, we're, what we build organizationally is, in effect, the assumptive state, right? That this is what we assume based on our best practices and experience people want. We have to validate that with our donors and our constituents to ensure that we're delivering on what they want. So... Think about this kind of donor centricity piece a little bit further. And, the, you know, kind of the, the best cartoons are funny because they're true. And I think this one's no exception, right? The, you know, our processes, our production timelines, our meetings, all of those things live behind that, that door that you see here. And I, I'd argue that many organizations are very likely spending disproportionately too much time behind the door as compared to, answering the phone and talking to and listening to constituents. So I you know, offer this as kind of a, a kind of food for thought is ask yourself two questions. One, do you think that you or and or the te your team and your organization can and should change that ratio, right? Or what it first, I think first question is, what do you think that ratio is for your organization? Do you think you can and should change it? And then, you know, as a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a baseline is which of these actions do you think will have the greatest impact on retaining donors 
or getting the second gift or giving outside of the event but to the organization? Is it an interaction that they've had with a customer service representative or do you think it's going to be because of the new touch point that we've kind of that we're crafting or a change that we're making to a welcome package? The reality is it's not an and it's not an or statement, it's an and statement. And that's why I would say focus on how do we kind of make sure that we're doing both of these things equally well. So I'm going to talk about donor journey, right? And that's, I think that's a term that I don't believe in many cases has enough teeth to it, but we're going to talk about that. And I, I want to talk about the donor journey is comprised of what we would refer to as touch points, right? And touch points in effect are every interaction that we're having with the organization, right? So this is not just simply the things that we're pushing outbound, but it's also the interaction that they're attempting to have inbound. Okay, and so the, the critical, critical thing to think about as we think about touch points is that you need to realize that every single touch point is going to have one of three impacts. It's either going to be positive, negative, or neutral. Okay, and there, the, I think there's a good argument and debate to continue to be had around that there's potentially no such thing as neutral. And in, in, in an ever more kind of time pressed, less um, kind of um, attention span, cluttered world in which we live, getting something that has no meaning to us is most likely going to be per perceived as a negative. There is a kind of volume machine that we live in, certainly in direct marketing, that we're kind of inundated with stuff. So if we're sending something with our logo that doesn't actually seem relevant to me, I think you could argue that potentially this is negative. So. And we have to really be cognizant. Frankly, we need to be much more precise with every single touch point, and we need to be listening to our donors to ensure each touch point is achieving its attended, intended purpose. L let me offer this as kind of a, a kind of a, a, a point of view here as well. We talk so often in the nonprofit space about the commercial sector, and we look to the commercial sector as being a bit ahead of us in many regards, and I think asking for feedback is certainly one of those things. Take, take your experience as just a traveler. By the end of a trip where you've traveled on, a, on an airplane, used Wi-Fi, stayed in a hotel, and rented a car, they're going to have, you'll receive multiple asks for feedback about that, right? And so asking, frankly, for feedback as consumers is expected, and it's, and it's really the exception, not the rule in the nonprofit space. But more importantly, we need to be thinking about asking for fee the way that we ask for it and when we ask for it. You know, Amazon is a is kind of the you know everyone always points to Amazon and Zappos of the world. They're great at this. You know what what they've identified and learned over time based on their customer experiences and their customer journey are the things that matter, right? And so these are two separate examples where they're asking for very specific feedback. On the one on the left. They're not just asking if I got my toaster oven or my, or my book. They're asking specifically about the packaging that it was delivered in because these two items were delivered through a third-party provider that they don't control, right? They're also then asking me separately about my experience using Amazon Pay as an example, right? You, you see this as well. You know, you know, the event space, here's an example of, of a run that was done through North Face. They had a long survey asking for feedback. And, and also let's look at kind of the kind of what the, the way that they're incentivizing feedback. On the left, 47 brand is actually offering me a 25% discount for my opinion. That's how certain they are uh, that my feedback will lead to relevant information, relevant information. Some of the most recent stats I've seen from the voice of the customer space is that the average ROI on a human interaction to fix a negative experience is between 50 and 70 percent. That's why you go to a store and people will circle on a receipt, give us your feedback today and receive 20 percent off your next purchase because they know how valuable that feedback is. And lastly, I'll add that let's, you know, you know, I was at IHOP and they asked me for feedback afterwards about my pancakes. We are in the business of asking people to support organizations, uh, and I'm certain we can do better than IHOP. They're, they've set the bar for us, so we've got to outperform pancakes, and I think we can do it. 
Here's some examples. We have, I'm not going to spend much time here, but I am going to kind of, uh, as we're going to kind of talk through how we're collecting feedback, this is kind of, you know, we've gotten into this business, frankly, more because there's a, 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 an, an urgent need for it and not because it was core to what we were going to be as we kind of thought about what donor voice was when we, when the company started five years ago. But collecting feedback is something that nonprofits can and should do. Here's some examples of how we're doing this across multiple channels, right? And we're looking at on the left, you're seeing kind of print inserts that are connected to uh, an inbound voice recorded phone number or a custom URL that will take you to a survey. Um, on the right, you're seeing a website page where we're asking for feedback now, uh, and, and we have some really great examples. I'll give a shout out to Jan Schultz at Project Hope as one of the people who I think is really leading the charge. We have been collecting feedback for her on constituents' experiences for better part of 18 months now, and one of those places in which we started was on the website, right? And there's the kind of, it's simply after the donation on the website. So finding that donate button on the homepage, clicking it, submitting through that form, and then reaching the confirmation page. We're asking for feedback. Here's how there's a question that we asked that was simply as part of that, that brief survey post-donation, we asked about the simple ease of the donation process and the form, okay? That orange bar and the date is, is showing you, the orange and blue is kind of how they rate it, either very easy or very difficult. That, uh, that experience of the ease of the donation process. We collected from June to October a, a lot of feedback and we did the analysis to figure out what the root cause was. What were the true pain points that they were up against? They made a number of changes in October, rolled out and stood up the new form, and you can see a complete reversal in ease of process. Okay, and as you know as a consumer, as you know, as a, uh, as, a, as a fundraiser, we have to make things easy as possible for our constituents to achieve what, what they want to achieve. So let's talk about the meat of this, okay? So we're, we're talking about kind of that retention blueprint, which is what I had set up. And I, I'm going to walk you through the process in which we go about kind of building that retention blueprint by collecting data that doesn't live on the CRM today, okay? And let me start by talking about metrics, okay? And, and this is us kind of bringing to the table a new set of data that, that is, is not on the file, not on the constituent record right now. We as direct marketers are great at measuring behavior, right? Meaning our result reports, we have our campaigns tracked to the per piece on cost. We know the response, we know how many people we sent it to, whether it was mail or email or phone calls that we made, and we can track response rate, we can track average gift. We are great on tracking behaviors and those behaviors are delivering our results. But the reality is that we need to understand is that we aren't directly influencing as direct marketers, their behaviors, okay? What we are influencing when we send you something is their attitude. I actually, I receive something and it makes me feel or think that this matters and therefore I take the behavior of giving or doing, right? Donating or signing up for an event or volunteering for an event. That's the piece that we are actually directly affecting is the attitude, okay? And the reality too is, and kind of to kind of put a fine point on the the idea of asking for feedback at all these different interactions is that every single one of these experiences is influencing our attitude. As I said before, all of these touch points are going to affect us positively or negatively, and we constantly are in evaluation mode when we look at this. Okay, so how do we get at attitude? I'll tell you now that this is not warm and fuzzy. This is something that can be measured as and built into a model as rigorously as you can a response model where you're just trying to get more people to give or to sign up. Okay, and let's kind of talk about how we get to that piece. So measuring loyalty, measuring attitude, okay? And this is looking at all of the experiences that we're serving up, all these, and this is illustrative that we kind of, our constituent experiences are our brand. It's, it's the key messages that we talk about. It's the communications that we're sending out, right? It's the interactions that they may have with donor services and fundraising and operations 
all of those things that we do, right? All those collective touch points. And what we need to figure out is which of these, how are these things affecting this piece in the middle, this attitude, which is leading to this behavior. This is where we kind of have come with, this process for us started about six years ago as a company, and this is relationship theory. This is not something that we invented, right? This has been well studied by academics, but the, the process goes as follows. Step one in relationship theory is building what, what is referred to as functional connection. This is your ability to, live, to deliver a reliable and consistent experience, okay? So said more simply is I made a donation, I received an acknowledgement, and they captured my information correctly, the amount that I gave and what I gave to, okay? We cannot achieve that. It's very likely this relationship will go no further, okay? There's three questions. We started with a list of 100 questions to measure this out, and there's three questions as part of our framework in which we're basically asking the, these three questions to get at a functional score. And I'm going to talk more about this as we go through this. Step two in this, in this relationship theory is personal connection. Okay, And this is the more emotive piece. This is Frankly, this is the one that's harder to achieve without human interaction, right? And in, in many cases, we, we don't have human interaction when we're trying to get people to sign up for events or volunteer, right? But this is the place where there's reciprocity, that I'm not just a number on the file, that I'm just not a human ATM that's being asked for money, but that you actually care about what my connection is and you're appealing to that. Both of these things lead into kind of the third measure of relationship theory, which is commitment. And commitment is kind of, by definition, is motive or intent to maintain a relationship. And this is useful, very useful, because as it's stated, this is forward-looking, right? So that we actually are looking at commitment. And, and like any sort of interpersonal relationship, where there's commitment, there's forgiveness, right? We will forgive small, small shortcomings or failures because we're committed to maintaining the relationship. So if we can measure this piece in the middle, we can begin to start explaining behavior, okay? So we're gonna do this in two ways, and I'm gonna kind of go through this in a little bit more detail. Step one is asking those nine questions. We are going to do a survey as part of kind of building this blueprint, okay? And the only reason we're doing the survey is because it simply is providing attitudinal data that does not exist on your database. We are not in the business of providing a 90-page PowerPoint deck of pie charts and bar graphs about how people ranked what they were most interested in. Because those are, frankly, they're bad questions that are not reliable and they're not answers that can be provided reliably in a vacuum and they couldn't give you those same answers consistently over time. Okay, so we are going to measure that, that loyalty piece first using the, the nine questions that we illustrate here. Each of these nine questions are asked on a zero to 10 scale and in aggregate, the whole thing is summed up and essentially created into an average, and we're creating two buckets of highly committed and low commitment people, okay? Part two of this is to start looking at combining the behavior, right? We are not saying that attitude, is, that we, we talk about a world in which we live today where we only track behavior, and we're saying that you should track attitude. We are not saying track attitude and not behavior. What we're suggesting is that Either way, one of them as a standalone is one hand clapping, and we want to bring both of those two things together. So once we do this kind of this sample, survey sampling and we have our cohort of people, we're going to then take all of their, the, the, the survey responses, all of their transactional data from the database, which is what we all faithfully have, and we're going to combine that. And we're going to look at how these things are, we're going to explain, in effect, giving right and how it fits together but the first part is we're going to look at the cohorts of how do those people that are kind of rated out by our model as high commitment by answering those nine questions versus low commitment okay and then and this box on the bottom right what you see is how people how their giving varies okay so we're overlaying actual giving to the org with their commitment score and we see this correlation the important distinction that needs to be made and made clear is that this is causal. I don't give and then become more loyal. I become more loyal based on my experiences and therefore I give. So said differently looking at the data, 
people that down here in this high commitment cohort have an average commitment score of an 8.9 and a lifetime value of $975, whereas low committed people have an average commitment score of 4.9 and an average value to the organization of $680, right? There's a 43% delta between those two numbers, okay? So what we now really need to get to, and this is ultimately where the fun begins, is we need to actually evaluate all of those touch points that we've kind of talked about and introduced so far, right? This part, that there's, this is, th that first part, those nine questions, that is kind of standard, that is our framework. If you're familiar with Net Promoter, they have their own framework. We've found through a lot of rigorous testing that these questions in the nonprofit space are much more correlated to giving and behavior than Net Promoter is. And it also, Net Promoter doesn't really frankly explain why people reach there. So that's what we're now getting to is how do we explain loyalty? More importantly, how do we change what we're doing so that we're creating more loyal donors? Okay, that's a mindset shift I think is important to make is that we are in the business of creating loyalty. There's not a untapped universe of people in New Mexico that we just haven't found yet that is loyal to your organization without doing it. We are in the process of building that, or we are in the business of building that. So looking at these experiences, this is where everything becomes 100% customized to the organization. We have a kickoff meeting and we collect, you know, kind of data about what are all the experiences that we're serving up? And they oftentimes in the event space kind of fit into these buckets. We want to talk about brand and message, events, fundraising, pre-event fundraising, event day, post-event, right? And start thinking about all of the possible things that are happening here, not just the things that we're sending out, but and what are we in the business of? You know, when we ask that question in the kickoff meeting, you know, there's there's at least five or six or maybe ten things that you're in the business of. And the reality is that it's very likely that not all of those matter equally. And in fact, some of those may not matter at all. Right. And so we are going to collect all of this and we're going to kind of create this customized survey where we're going to be asking about quality ratings on the current world. Okay. And here's an example, just an, and I know I, one of the things we found in kind of the peer to peer space is that many organizations, if you're have, if you have chapters or affiliates, uh, you know, the, the kind of the people that we end up working with don't own everything, right? So they'll say that, well, we are doing 150 walk events across the country, but not all of them are doing exactly the same thing, okay? And so these are kind of illustrations of kind of the questions that we can ask, right? And that you'll find by looking at and reviewing this list that these things all very often kind of cover the bases, okay? And we, we, we also include kind of an unable to rate option on some of these things as well. So, and that will be useful in us kind of identifying, hey, we think that we're doing something, but no one actually has awareness of it. And that, that in and of itself is important. What we're, what, what's worth kind of illustrating here is that, as the, as the title suggests, we are going to be asking simply about quality rating of that experience or that that component, right? So how a uh, question one, how good of a job does organization X do at conducting research to end insert disease for forever? And we're looking simply for them to answer that question on a zero to ten zero to ten scale of how good of a job. We're not asking about importance, we're not asking about rank order, because those are things that they can't provide. And in effect, the answers to these individual questions are frankly not particularly useful right? Just how good of a job. You need to know what, how does it matter? And then is it actually effectively working? And that's what we're going to get to. And that's how we do this through kind of our statistical exercise. So this is how we bring these two things together. We talk about, we collect attitude on the survey sample, and then we ask everybody about quality of the rating. And then through our statistical analysis, we're going to group all of those things together and we're going to be able to provide and rank order these things back to you and show you what things are key drivers of the relationship that are working. And then by probably not a leap of faith, there are some things that matter that we are actually not great at. And then equally important is there's some things that we're doing that potentially are not important to the relationship. Okay. And so 
this becomes an effective data reduction exercise. The example that we often use is in the, in the, in the kickoff meeting, we can fill whiteboards, no homework required. And if we get a good cross section of people, we can fill the whiteboard with all that we do. But if I asked and I handed someone in the room on the team a red marker and said, go to the board and start crossing out the things that don't matter or start circling the things that you think matter, but we're not great at, this is all going to be a guessing game. Right, and that's ultimately what we're providing insight into. So, how does it play out? Okay, in in this instance, and I think this is certainly useful, um, kind of as a kind of an example for the market, is that not all experiences matter equally to every single person. Okay, not even based on high commitment and low commitment. So, what we will look at, and certainly this happens in the event space. In this case, we were looking at people that have a relation to disease, and we we're also looking at the different types of event participants, the team captains, the top fundraisers, the no pays, uh, the team participants, right? And what we found was that we actually had two very different audiences. We had one group of people that had relation to disease and or were team captains, and then we kind of grouped everybody else into another bucket, okay? And what we found was, you know, as no surprise, their giving is different, Right, and this is looking at some of their behavior, but also their loyalty is different. Okay, and what this is telling us is that within these two cohorts of people, we potentially need to essentially have two separate plans. Right, and it's not drastically different. And let me kind of explain how this kind of plays out. So, at a very high level, what we've done here is we've kind of kind of summarized for you kind of those key experience buckets on the left: for message, fundraising, engagement, and so on. Okay. And then what, we've, what we're showing you is basically a rank order of importance, relative importance uh, to these different cohorts. And what we're finding is that kind of core message matters about the same, right? But what you find is kind of fundraising is really ultimately what matters to the, uh, the, the, the all other people, right? The, the, the people that are team captains and those with disease, those people are focused on engagement matters and post event what you're doing around the year outside of the event season is what matters to these people okay getting into these categories of people uh, or these categories of experiences and in and basically putting more focus on them matter to these people so here's the blueprint this is the ultimate deliverable right and this uh, i'm going to kind of this is a bit of an eye chart but i think that this is we have found tremendous use in making sure that this is all presented in one view. So all of those experiences that we served up, we've kind of talked about how, uh, how, we, how commitment connects to giving, okay? But what we want to explain is, well, what are all those things that are doing that we influence it? How do we actually build loyalty, okay? So I'll just kind of orient you to this. We're gonna, we're gonna uncover all of those touch point quality rating questions. And in this case, I believe there was between 35 and 45 different touch points that we isolated. And we're gonna put them into two columns. Into the, the center column is key experiences that they matter, and they're gonna be color coded blue or red. Blue means they're above average performance, red means below average performance. And then this left hand column is gonna be things that don't matter to the relationship, okay? And we label that as reallocate resources. In short, because we haven't run across many organizations that are constantly ramping up their expense budget every year. So the real question becomes, what kind of stuff are we doing right now that we're spending time, effort, and money on that are not actually positively or negatively impacting the relationship? The question that we would raise is, should we consider taking that time, effort, and money and putting it into fixing or working on how do we improve some of these key experiences that have a below average performance rating? So Here's kind of one way to uncover this, okay? This is event day. And again, we've done the, the modeling exercise to combine that attitudinal measure with the experience. And now what we're looking at is within the event day, all of these things that you see here, these 11 questions, every statement on here was a question, kind of grouped together into that event day bucket, okay? The things that you're seeing on the right in the blue box are the things that matter to, the, to building relationship strength. And the things that you're seeing on the left do not, okay? And I'm just gonna uncover the rest of this and we'll kind of talk about this. What you're also seeing on here is dollar values. And in effect, what we're doing is we're kind of showing you that this is, this is 
basically nothing more than a data reduction and a prioritization exercise. So we're telling you what should be in and what should be out. The things in the center column are what should be in. The things on the outside are the things that don't matter and should be out. And then of the things that matter, this center column, what we're basically doing is we're giving you a rank order of importance. We're taking essentially, to kind of use uh, nerdy statistical uh, kind of speak, we're taking the coefficients, and the higher the coefficient, the higher the influence that variable is on the model, and we're just translating them into dollar amounts that are connected to the, met, the, the, the giving off the database that we got. Okay, so as we look at this, fundraising is rep for general participants is representing a much larger proportion of the influence on relationship strength than these other measures are. I won't go through this in detail, but just to highlight as an example a couple of things. In terms of pre-event, what we found is here are the five things pre-event that matter, okay? Everyone is clear on the fact that they have been registered. They have been kind of given helpful tools to register. Um, but where the pain exists is the actual online registration process and the actual process of setting up your fundraising page or finding information specific to setting up your fundraising page in the participant center. At the event day, kind of look at that center column versus that left column, right? Things that matter here are, you know, you know kind of convenient rest stops, accessible restrooms, educational info, the sound system. Right, those are all things that matter. What things don't have an influence is, uh, you know, as you kind of look at, you know, having pins there or um, recognizing, you know, you know, top fundraisers at the event um, or having people write notes or even in this instance with this walk, kind of receiving a medal upon completion. You know, that that's going to be very specific, I think, to to the type of event. Marathons are going to be different than this kind of a 5K walk, but kind of the question gets raised should they in fact actually be considering reallocating the spend on medals to some of these other things in terms of providing better speakers, working on the sound system, or kind of ramping up some of these other things that exist in here. So there's a lot here. We'll absolutely share this out after for people to digest um, and, and that we certainly can ask more questions as we go throughout. The other part of this is kind of how, so the, the, the next natural question is, when we look at this blueprint and we say, okay, well, that's great. Now I know what matters. But of these things that are broken, how do I fix them? Right? These things that are in red, why are, they, why are people saying they aren't, aren't working? So we can certainly look at that process. But what we also do is we're looking at essentially the open-end comment that's provided. So at the end of the survey, we are asking a unguided question around, is there anything else you'd like to share with organization X today? Okay, and the things that matter to the individuals, they will begin to surface on their own, right? Now, in a vacuum, just looking at open and comment and overreacting to one person's comment and saying we should change that for everybody is wrong. This, in effect, becomes kind of a, a way for us to kind of source and mind this, essentially kind of collecting hints as to why this is not optimized, right? So kind of we look at pre-event and that bucket and here are those three things that loaded into the model but were below average. We can now start to look at why people are actually showing and what their comments are around help with fundraising or website difficulty. Just for context, what this is showing you is when we did text analysis on all of that open end comment, you know, these are basically the eight categories of feedback that per, that pop the most. And then what we did was we basically are showing how that feedback kind of was broken out by, by constituent type. In this case, I believe these are team members, these are top fundraisers, these are team captains, and so on, right? And so you want to understand why the this is difficult to set the fundraising page? We can actually mine this and we can start to source and look at what people's pain points are when, when, they, when they look at this. So that's the blueprint, right? And this is, is, in my view, a critical piece. The answers, we've been doing this for almost six years now, and I'll tell you one thing we found is that there's no such thing as perfect best practice, right? There are things based on experience that have worked, but as we all know probably through our own testing and time is that just because something worked for somebody else doesn't mean it's going to work for us, right? So 
building that blueprint and having that in front of you, now we've basically informed this, guys, is what's mattering to our constituents in the experience that we're delivering. Now how do we go about changing it and applying this, okay? And that's what I'm going to kind of talk about very briefly here. So this is kind of the map. This is the process. The, um, I, I take this term, uh, you know, donor-driven design and hear, create, deliver. Uh, there's kind of a great company called IDEO. If you've never seen them, they're probably one of the most innovative small shops in the world. I believe they're, one of their claims to fame is, is actually designing the uh, first mouse for the Macintosh computer. Um, and it's all about this idea of human-centered design. If you've ever seen any of their work, what their focus is is not just evaluating something, but, but getting people to go and use and do things and break things and figure out how different types of people are breaking things. Uh, one of their best is uh, they did a, a thing for 60 Minutes, I believe, years ago, where they uh, 60 Minutes challenged them to redesign the shopping cart in the grocery store in 72 hours. And one of the main inputs was just taking different people mothers with small children, elderly, so busy people, and so on and so forth, and watching them interact with the product. This is, in effect, what we're trying to do, right? So what I've walked you through is kind of gathering the missing data that's not on your CRM today, which are those attitudinal scores and those quality measures. And then we do the analysis and build this, this blueprint, okay? And what, what you need to do now is kind of map that, that donor experience, what, as I refer to as kind of assumptive state, Let's get down what we're currently doing and let's evaluate these things and then let's actually map out how we would change these things. All of these things can be easily implemented and tested, right? This is the idea that we're kind of working off of. So there's kind of a couple of different ways in which we're applying the insights. One is at the touch point level and two is at the overall experience level. So here's one view of it, is that kind of taking all this, that scorecard, some of those, those interactions that you saw in that blueprint are kind of what we would refer to as point in time, right? There's kind of, you know, the, the day of event and there's kind of speakers and bathrooms and, and so on and so forth. But there's also content, right? And that brand bucket should not be, I didn't talk about it here because I think it's very specific organizationally, but this matters, right? And, and ultimately what we found is that the messaging that we want to put in front of people living with the disease versus people that do not have the disease is different. And working with, certainly in the health space with a lot of health organizations, you know, what we found is that they do have good coverage of people on relation to disease, but yet the, 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 the difference in the experience they deliver is almost identical. It may be a line of copy that says, as someone who has experience with disease X, you know, dot, 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 and then everything else is the same, okay? And I, I really think, as well, I'm kind of using the example of disease here, I think that, you know, across the board, every organization has distinct constituent types, right, that you can and should be talking to differently. But based on the blueprint, what we talked about is, look, we need to be, those people with disease, we need to be talking about promoting services and support, gift impact, mission focus, right? Not so much kind of the institutional view of the organization, how much money you're pouring into research or making me feel like I'm thanked because I'm a good person because I supported your organization. This seems obvious on the, uh, on the surface when you look at it now, but in many regards, it's not, right? And, 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 and in terms of actual application, many organizations do not know, they, while they know that there's a connection or they know this identity, they're doing very little to, dis to differentiate, and they can and should. So you'll see columns here. We literally were taking this and using it as our scorecard, right? How do we, okay, let's evaluate the, the welcome email that goes out post-registration, or let's look at the kind of the five ways you can help, um, you know, welcome package that gets delivered four, four weeks later. And essentially, let's, let's look at and score you know, red X's where you're doing things that don't matter on green check marks where you are. And let's evaluate these things and see if we really are, in fact, delivering on these messages. And we find kind of immediate kind of quick wins, if you will, in terms of improvements that can and should be made. The second piece is starting to think about this in terms of the broader donor experience, okay? And I'm going to show this in kind of a real-time view. This is a, uh, a kind of a mapping tool, and I would encourage everybody to start thinking about if you want to put real teeth behind it, your, your, donor, your donor journey can't live in an Excel document, okay? It really needs to be something that you can kind of pivot on and look at. And I would even argue that, you know, 
mapping it with post-it notes on a wall and then taking a photo of it on your cell phone, which so many of us do, is also an inefficient way to do it. There's plenty of tools out there. This is a, a donor journey tool that we use that I think is critical. And what, what you're looking at here is, in short, this is rows and columns in its simplest form. We've got all these r columns here. And in this view, I'll show you what we're kind of talking about is the life stages of this uh, of this event program, right? So kind of the acquisition phase and deciding to register. There's the event registration and setup phase, which we broke down into step one of actually registering for the event, and then step two of actually setting up your fundraising page. And then there's kind of this period in the middle, which is gonna uh, will vary based on kind of how far in advance they signed up for the event. But you know all the things that are happening, kind of stewardship or otherwise. Kind of as they kind of the events approaching, whether it's kind of encouraging you to fundraise with your friends and peers, or kind of preparing for you know uh, an endurance run or an event or you know whatever it might be, and then there's the actual event itself, right? The event experience. There's the day of the event, and then there's kind of the initial follow-up to the event, and then there's the all-important kind of non-event season, right? And this can ultimately range to be you know 12 months if you want to look at it this way. But what's important here is that what we've done is we took kind of a snapshot of all the touch points that happen within this organization and now what we've been able to do is kind of sort them based on the input and the insight and the model that we built using the blueprint these are the things that are the positive positive experiences these are the things that are the negative experiences okay that we need to be looking at these are all color coded what i'm showing you with the color is actually channel okay and you're, you're looking at so things that are happening in direct mail versus email in blue versus social media in light blue, uh, the actual uh, event itself in orange. There could be telemarketing, so on and so forth. But the other piece, and then we also have kind of icons. This is kind of talking to you with a little bit of detail about that, look, acquisitions on an ongoing monthly basis rolling. There's multiple events and so on and so forth. But what you really want to look at is how do we now overlay this with donor sentiment? And that's what I've now populated all of the donor sentiment. This is, a, in effect, the validation that we've done, right? What I showed you without donor sentiment was what I was referring to as that assumptive state. Now what we're showing you is, okay, we have assumptive state. Now we've validated it with the donor experience and the donor sentiment. And here's where we're starting to kind of surface for them kind of where the pain points are, right? So the massive pain point, as you kind of maybe saw in the blueprint, around kind of the registration process. And this is a touch point that we would recommend adding, right? Just akin to what you saw in the very beginning when we talked about feedback and we talked about the commercial sector. Right after they registered for the event, we should not assume success, okay? I may have actually made it through, but it may have required me 10 attempts to do so. I may have given the wrong amount. I may have not been able to register more than one person. All of these things are going to influence whether or not I continue, okay? So as opposed to just telling them instantly, share this on social media and Facebook and Twitter, or go and send eight fundraising emails. Let's make sure they achieved what they wanted to, okay? The same occurs here with the difficulty of setting up the fundraising page. Um, providing them, this is something that we found that mattered in that blueprint, right? Kind of the, kind of the experience information. So we need to do more. This, these are things that actually all work. Right? How do we scale this? So if we know something matters and we're doing a great job, should we potentially try to do more of it? Right? How do we, what are the more helpful tools and resources that we should constantly be driving these people towards? Okay? Um, and then kind of day of event. You know, these are the things that matter. Let's, in, in our best practices document, if you will, for this organization, these guys, these are things that we're doing well. Here's how you do them well. Right? And let's say, hey, guys, these are the things that you should pay attention to. Let's make sure that we have a strong sound system and let's make sure we have good speakers that we, we have, right? So we're starting to kind of combine and overlay this information. And now what we build is a very kind of purposeful action plan in terms of how people can start to change the experience. So in summary, this is, this is kind of a snapshot, if you will, of kind of a top 10. Right. This is what we, through this process with this one organization, this case study, we delivered back to them. Right. And we said these are the things that matter most. Okay. So now, how do you prioritize all the things that you want to do in preparation for this upcoming walk event season? And look at this. 
Okay, and uh, I, I won't read off all of these, but you know, kind of number one is, you know, we probably have some sense of loss at the top of the funnel, if you will, on based on people that abandon, you know, the registration pages through your kind of click through and your Google Analytics, if you will. Um, growth isn't easy, you know, uh, and, and very few programs are growing, uh, you know, so we have to make this easy. So post registration, setting up a listening post and reacting to people that had a negative experience and helping to kind of shepherd them through to the next phase is a critical piece, okay? Number four on the list, we kind of talk about, you know, um, you know, post registration and incentives. I didn't go into it today. There's a lot that's been written about incentives. There's varying degrees of need here, and it's going to be, I think, very specific to your event model, um, registration fee or no registration fee, things like that. In this case, there was no registration fee, and there was a real pain point around kind of a price point that was associated with getting the T-shirt. I believe it was, you know, once you raise $150, then you'll receive your, your event T-shirt. And as a consumer, as a kind of just a doer in the world, we aren't connecting that, oh, I, it's because I didn't pay a registration fee here, but I did pay a registration fee over here, right? And so we talked about how do you use the, uh, the incentive of a T-shirt, maybe more so uh, up further in the funnel and use it as a nudge for actually saying, hey, let's actually, once people set up their fundraising page and send 10 emails, then they get a T-shirt, right? Because at that point, we know that we've got them and that they're, they've achieved success and they're doing what we want. And if they've sent 10 emails, they're gonna raise more than probably the $150 that, that, that we need. Um, number five, you know, kind of looking at kind of the, you know, the experiences, some of these things matter, so, you know, we, we have to be thinking about kind of that frequency piece. You know, the, the, as I said before, we've got positive, negative, and neutral. So how do we look at kind of that, the things that we send out, it's kind of a tightrope that you must walk. So in every case, we found that the coaching uh, and kind of support emails matter. So that's where we can kind of do more kind of, you know, kind of touch points and kind of engagement with people. So in effect, that's ultimately where I guess we did some mapping as a group with them to kind of figure out impact and level of effort. And then they've kind of taken this in-house and started to work towards kind of updating best practice documents uh, in terms of that they're sharing with their affiliates and their chapters. And then also kind of bigger initiatives. You know, they, they are at the national office, they tend to own the software and things like that. They've now set up listening posts, changing the actual software. There's, you know, a great example here is we can make as many changes as we want to, but there's just the uh, there's the element of human just interaction that will always get in the way. A good example is a, a, a person was having trouble uh, signing up, and they said that their uh, credit card had been continuing to be rejected, and they actually were able to call donor services while they were on the on the phone. And the woman walked the donor services rep walked the person through the process, and when she when it said um, name on card in the field the person was typing in visa and at that moment kind of on her own realized that name on card actually was referring to her name right and so there's these things that we ultimately can't avoid but we've got to make it easy and help people through that process so i know there's a lot of information that we covered um david i am kind of back to you are there you know i, I know potentially there might be some questions I, I think we've got just a couple of minutes maybe to field one or two and i'm happy to kind of help field some of those after the fact. Uh, terrific. Well, thank you so much. Um, we did have one question, a very specific uh, question, which was uh, looking back at slide 23, you had a, a variety of categories uh, that you were to, uh, uh, I think that you had divided people up into uh, with two letter uh, abbreviations. And we were, had a question about that from Janelle. Yeah. Yeah, th this was looking at um, kind of the feedback. We looked at all of the open and comment that we received, and then we what we have from the database is kind of the all of the identifiers that you know uh, that I'm a team member, or I'm a team captain. So these right here, what we were doing is we were actually looking at feedback in those kind of constituent segment groupings. Of and this, I think I was saying this is TM for team member. TF, I believe in their instance, was top fundraiser. TC was team captain. So we just wanted to look for kind of how the different constituent groups were actually responding. Was, was a certain pain point uh, something that was very clear to a certain constituent segment of people? Great, uh, Jen, thank you. And uh, Julie asks, how long did this process take? 
Yeah, the process end to end is about eight to twelve weeks. So you know, kind of step one is kind of you know basically doing that kickoff meeting that we talked about and kind of getting that group. You know, that's that's pretty pretty much about a two to three hour meeting. The the nice part of this is that we do all the heavy lifts. So we we. The, the, I think we've kind of mapped this out in a number of instances. Client engagement here is, is typically about uh, seven to ten hours in total. So we'll have a kickoff meeting. As I said, there's no homework required. We'll craft the survey. That's about two weeks of kind of back and forth in terms of making sure that we get that survey, kind of that, that piece correct. About one to two weeks in terms of programming it. We do all this online um, for the most simply mainly for time and cost and speed. Um, and about two to four weeks after that, we do analysis, and then we break up this. We'll kind of do a briefing with stakeholders, and then we'll workshop this with kind of groups of, of kind of team people. So uh, Chelsea asks, for organizations who may not be able to devote a lot of time or staff resources or, I would, I guess, budget to developing these analytics, what's the big takeaway of what we should focus our time and energy on? Is it... Is it going to be, are there some certain commonalities that you'll find between groups? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, listen, I think if there's if there's one thing that you should start doing today is I think that you should be in the, kind of going back to the cartoon. I think that you should actually spend more time kind of collecting feedback from constituents. There's a lot of ways to do that. And frankly, there's, there, you know, we have a platform that's, you know, uh, it's low cost and it's very automated. So once it's up, we're kind of just pushing reports and you can start listening to that. You know, I mean, just even if you're not responding to it, as long as we're listening and we're looking at how do we actually fix root cause. So maybe we're not going to go back and fix that individual's problem. But if we start to see this and we're going to identify root cause, we can start to reduce effort for our constituents and all that they're trying to achieve and do online or, or offline, right, just by kind of making the process easier. So if there's one place to start, it's just get into the business of asking for feedback. You know, that, as I said before, this project in and of itself is, you know, we're talking seven to ten hours of total invested time in terms of helping us kind of be at the kickoff meeting, getting someone to help us kind of pull data out of the database, things like that. Um, so it's not a heavy lift, but get that it's not for everybody and everyone has competing priorities. But everybody should ask, be, start asking for feedback in some way, shape, or form. So I know you've anonymized this case, which is really a fascinating case, but this online registration uh, being priority number one uh, and number two, and it's, it's, it's a biggie. Uh, do, do you know uh, on a very granular level what, what kind of things that they changed that improved that? Yeah. So some of it was like kind of the, the illustration that I used. Some of it was just simply kind of, you know, changing the actual required fields on the form, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of, um, you know, in terms of registering what was required and what was not required. Uh, it was so, so simple as that. And they, they had a bit of a kind of a wonky setup with the credit card information and selecting the event that you wanted to go to, right? So there was kind of a, a simple pain point associated with that. Um, the, the, the one of the other pieces that you kind of think about, it was this registration kind of fit into two categories. It was kind of just simply registering for the event, but also then setting up the fundraising page. You know, there was some feedback in there. there there's a, a lack of awareness, frankly, for some of these people that are new to this type of thing. Uh, people saying that uh, at the end, I had no idea that I was going to get my own or I had to build my own website, right? That they didn't realize that they were going to have a fundraising page. So kind of set you know they, in reality in many cases especially around that they had a lot of helpful tools as you saw here that actually was a positive experience for them but what they needed to do is they actually had like a youtube tutorial on how to um set up your fundraising page and what it was like but the reality was it was like set you know touch point seven in the sequence so i i registered for the event and then i got an email that said great now send this to eight people and raise money but you hadn't even actually realized well how are they going to give me their money are they going to send me checks and i'm going to get it so what we talked about was simply repurposing or just kind of reordering some of the kind of mm. the, the collateral that they already had and said right afterwards let's send them this youtube tutorial about setting up your fundraising page and why it matters and it's going to push that up into the funnel and so that email came before people were kind of already kind of prompted to go now send out eight emails and set up your fundraising 